Thank you, Carolina. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so I think we're going to have a reasonably informal conversation. Um, and Melanie's going to show some extracts of the work as well. And we're going to talk around this piece in particular, Maria Elena, that's being shown upstairs, but also link that, I think, try and link that with other aspects of Melanie's practice. So um, I'm not sure maybe where to begin, whether we want to show something, some footage first, or whether I can start by asking you about how this project arose, what, was, what the genesis was of this film project. Um. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, obviously, I think it, it comes through um, a sort of um, uh, interest or history. I think always, you know, one project kind of comes out of another project in a way, you know, you always, um, uh, there's, you're always kind of looking for something that you, maybe you didn't explore in the last project or some way to take the last project further, you know. So um, I um, was invited by uh, Proyecto Atacama, which is, um, uh, a small organization uh, which Alexia Tala runs in, um, in Chile and Santiago. And her project is kind of, well, it's a sort of initiative that invites people to do projects in the Atacama Desert, really. Um, and she had seen the, the last film that I made, which was uh, called Forlandia. I made it in, um, uh, in the Amazon. And it was, this film, Forlandia, was Similar in certain senses, it was about um, kind of um, these figures or companies that um, kind of um, insert themselves into landscapes, into well, North American figures, really, the Guggenheims in this case, and uh, the other case, um, Henry Ford, who went to, um, uh, to set up a business in the jungle in the 1920s, in the Brazilian jungle. Um, and to make um, uh, rubber uh, for the tires for his, uh, for his cars. So um, that project was really kind of about sort of animals, res resistance of nature, and this idea of this sort of somehow kind of the exotic gaze planting themselves into this very small town. In uh, or he made it really in the jungle, this very small town. So this project was kind of, um, I think, a, a sort of sister project really to the Fordlandia project, where um, uh, again, apart, you know, through this invitation, which uh, Alexia sort of thought that, you know, this would somehow interest me, um, we went started looking around these mines in uh, the north of Chile, <clears throat> in the desert. Um, and these, there's a lot of mines there now, but um, this one particularly interested me. This one's called Maria Elena, which takes, it's the name of the film. And it's the oldest uh, salt mine in, um, in the area. And um, uh, Again, it was sort of, I mean, sister or sister project in to Fordlandia in the sense that it was the same kind of idea where the, where the Guggenheim family had started um, extracting um, potassium, sodiums, lithiums um, in the area. And then, um, you know, uh, obviously using these extractions for fertilizers for even now they, so they use for iPhones, that kind of thing. And th this was sort of interesting to me about how, in a way, this sort of, um, the kind of exotic gaze, I suppose, these, these companies just sort of planting themselves in, and how the industries had sort of built themselves around the mines, or like train, for example, was, the train was built kind of around the mining system. So, um, you know, we, I didn't exactly know what I would do, but I knew that there was some kind of parallel between these very different landscapes, but these same kind of initiatives. Um, and um, 
I was interested in here in how one could kind of, I suppose, talk about the, the, the arid, brutal nature of the desert and this kind of extra extraction that is going on there, which is also extremely kind of underground. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, who <laughs> in, in, the, in, in the Amazon, we kind of somehow see it a lot more or you feel it a lot more because it's, you know, the sort of savagery of animals, trees for coming down, burning. And in the Atacama Desert, you know, some of these mines can go down one, two kilometers. So there's something kind of interesting for me about the um, sort of hiddenness, in a way, about this extraction. Um, well, there, there's mm -hmm. a contra contradiction there in terms of the landscape being so open and open to vision, open to visibility, and yet somehow this being a hidden process. But I guess yeah. the, the, the thing that links the two films is this theme of extractive capitalism. Yeah. Is that right? Y yeah. Yes. And, and, and I think this idea of, um, I suppose that these were both projects that were going on at the turn of the century. Um, and, you know, I thought something that was interesting to me in the case of Henry Ford, at least, was that he never actually went to Fordlandia. He sent down the American workforce, American machinery, American team who were sort of subjected to uh, eating, living, uh, American, you know, day and how, um, you know, it was actually, a, in, in the end, it turned out to be a, a dystopian project. It was one of his projects that didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, or, I guess that's yeah. one of the, the great contrasts with these two case studies. I guess, I guess yeah. these kind of essays yeah. on, on, on capitalism that is that the, the Ford project failed ultimately. Yes. Whereas this, you're going into a situation with Maria Elena, which is continuing to the present day, yes. even though in a reduced form. Yeah, it does. I mean, it, it is, like I say, it is still the oldest. This is, um, I'll show, show you this. This is Maria Elena, actually. This is the town of Maria Elena. Um, interesting because it's kind of built on this European hexagonal kind of modern city shape, just kind of there on, you know, in the middle of nothing. And then you can just see on the on the right hand side is the the existing um, mine, which is just about working. That there's other sites now which are much more kind of contemporary and are much more producing much, much more. This is kind of really, uh, yeah, sort of feels, you know, the, the machinery, the, the housing, everything feels, um, you know, very sort of turn of the century old. <laughs> and I think what was interesting, again, like the Ford system, where there was a system here of the town kind of was, sh well, shipped in from, and to, to the date, there actually people that, live in these places, the workforce, usually the sort of three or four days um, living there, and then the rest of the time they go out to, to more to the, to, towards the coast near Antofagasta. They're not there um, all of the time, so it's very much just a sort of a work and actually quite male place, I have to say that it's quite interesting in that sense that it's, it's quite a you know, huge uh, percentage of the workforce that they are male and they're there for probably four to five days and then they have two days off. And so it's quite a, a sort of strange setup in these places and also at the beginning of the century there was no monetary system there so everything was based on a system of tokens and these tokens appear in the film um, where uh, the tokens for example you'd have one token for bread there was a sort of the little shop in the in the um, in the town, where flour, water, bread, all these things were exchanged um, for food, uh, so it was um, is sort of sort of endemic system in itself, where work and labour um, were not uh, well, the economy was not sort of run through, um, I suppose this this sort of monetary monetary system. It was a, a much more an exchange kind of system. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, that, I think that helps to frame 
the project to, to understand how, how it came about and how you ended up in the Atacama and, and how it contrasts in terms of the landscape of Latin America mm -hmm. with the previous project, Fordlandia. Um, and I, I also wanted to raise the other film that has been called a trilogy mm. with these two films, which is, is Hilitla. So mm. to what extent do you think that that is a trilogy of films? Hilitla being a similar investigation of aspects of the landscape and the presence of a kind of Anglo-colonialism mm. and early, early modernity. Mm. But it's somehow slightly different to Fordlandia and, and Maria Elena in, in that it's not about capitalism per se or, or these kind of industrial projects. Mm. I don't know what it is there. There's this sort of magnet I have, I suppose, for somehow um, stratifying or using these places um, as, I mean, they have been described as, I suppose, within the context of me, my work as these heterotopic spaces where, you know, there's these sort of non-places in a way where I find some interest, yes, especially how these these you sort of Anglo-Saxon figures end up somehow um, um, changing and, and or imposing themselves on these on these landscapes. Um, and I think it's a kind of process which I, that I'm always working through within the films of of kind of um, starting off, I suppose, with this sort of. Um, some kind of a reference point, these sort of historic points in history, but at the same time then kind of finding a set of actions or, or, or yeah, scenarios that can also take place, I suppose, with, within my film. But these, the research, that the, I don't know if it is research, sounds a bit grand research, but these things that I get interested, I suppose, in were... Um, kind of, they come from this historic uh, starting point, and then they get sort of turned some into these quite sort of surreal, uh, fictionalized spaces. Um, and I think that, I suppose one of the things that they all have in common is that I'm, in none of these spaces, uh, am I trying to do any a kind of documentary. In a sense, it's sort of the inverse of documentary. And I think that, um, the way that I'm using um, uh, framing in all of these films has this kind of sort of yeah the, the sort of um, yeah the inversion of a documentary where where I never start with an establishing shot we kind of know we're in the desert we kind of know we're in the jungle or we kind of know we're in this strange place uh, Hilitla where um, which was in the, in the Mexican Mexican jungle but I don't really try to tell you uh, through normal sort of linear narratives where you are. So I think there's this kind of push and pull about the idea of place. I think I'm re trying to somehow um, redefine in some way our geopolitical sense of place by actually throwing these places through framing, through using these very big sort of macro, uh, uh, sorry, micro, micro kind of relationships of scale where these um, places actually get somehow sort of dislocated in terms of their geographic um, location. It's definitely not about description that I'm trying to... Maybe if I put on a few minutes, yes, you know, just yeah. so that we're just not talking completely in a sort of abstraction here. Um, This is from the beginning, so I'll leave it on for a few minutes.
boring. Maybe I'll put on a bit over it, but that probably sorry that probably gives enough sort of idea to sort of but maybe we could talk through yeah a few yeah, of those ideas yeah. that you can see that are happening I suppose there in the film. One th one thing I wanted to slightly shifting the conversation a bit mm. is having seen that um, one of the things that really interests me is how you shift through different visual registers, and I wondered if you could talk about very much this, what I think is a very strong line in your work, which is, is painting. Um, how, what is the relationship between film and painting in this piece in particular, and the idea of texture and surface? Um, well, I think in, in, in all of my work, there is, um, in very, very different ways, there, there is somehow, as a motivation or starting point the 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 pictorial frame is a part of it the idea of the rectangle what happens beyond inside the rectangle what happens not just in the sort of physical rectangle itself but the the idea of i suppose the um the the outside the frame you know and and that not 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 just in the sense of the physical frame but the sort of let's say the geopolitical frame, that's really sort of something that has always been very um, interesting to me. But it, in this uh, project in particular, um, I think it's kind of um, obvious in a way how um, the, um, um, uh, these, these um, swimming pools, uh, well not swimming pools, the, the, these pools rather, which where the, um, the lithiums, the sodiums, the potassiums are kind of um, let to um, uh, sort of uh, mineralize, if you want, 
as part of the industrial process, these become to me like these really sort of scary, um, abstract expressionist mm -hmm. um, sort of... Uh, mater material abstract paintings yes. almost, from, from above. Yeah. I think you had as an image of one of Yeah, those, I think there's some uh, here, here, for example, this one. Of course, this becomes like some sort of, yeah, sort of um, terrorized B-side of um, uh, ex expressionism. So I think that there's something for me which I'm always kind of, you know, always sort of accessing round is how is this sort of idea of the frame, the modernist frame, as in painting, um, and and how the idea, I suppose, of the looking through the window of the frame, how this, in the context of Latin America, or different peripheries, Latin America happens to be where I won, where I've worked out of a lot, mm -hmm. but how this idea of the, the surface materiality is, is completely kind of destroyed, this idea of sort of spiritualism, the window, the painting, um, looking through, we really kind of see the B side of this sort of um, the grottiness, the, the the terror, this sort of geological terror in a way of 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 of, of these these um, this this these frames, I suppose. As I think, so I guess it's yeah. it's, it's a very violent yeah. process that underlies this yeah. and yeah. Con contan contaminating yeah. the landscape or literally blowing it to pieces. Yeah, so it's I not guess. always, it's, it's, I suppose, it's when I say the B-side, it's this sort of, this destroying, I suppose, this modernist idea of the utopian frame somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a, a topic that comes uh, back and back in my work, not only in this one. I mean, it's, it's kind of, I think, it's quite obvious in this that you can almost see, you know, sort of, almost, I don't know, sort of Clifford Steele or there are, uh, there's one, I'm not sure if it appears here, that there's a uh, oh, here it, you know, that sort of almost like a, a Martin or a, Agnes you know, Martin, right? yes, an Agnes Martin or there's another one. Oh, here we are, Ryman, um, where is this, this, this sort of purity of white here um, is, has a very different sort of significance. And here, here's actually the, the pool, the, what is it, they call them piscina, the pools themselves where they bring up this, this, um, this sort of chemicals in a way, bring up these sort of crazy colors and, 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 and um, formations. And they're over you know, kilometers in the desert, yeah. these things. But in this and the previous, uh, it's another form of the modernist grid as well, yeah. I mean, somehow. So yeah. this is all very consciously yeah. thought through in, in yeah. uh, relation, in through the filmic in relation to painting. Yes, yes, I'm always really, really conscious of that. And uh, at the same time, it's always sort of dismounting these sort of, I suppose, you, you know, it's as well, like I was just saying just now, it's sort of, it's also, uh, as well as dismounting painting itself, it's also dismounting the idea of a sort of documentary style, because I think uh, if you can probably kind of see in those those first few minutes there's the, the way I'm using the aerial and then the the very the real sort of close-up so it's about kind of in a way um, um, yeah disappropriating place and at the same time creating these kind of elliptical structures mm -hmm. which um, which appear and, and at the once come back with it throughout the film. So we might have, say, for example, um, a sort of landscape, landscape, body, machine, machine, body, ma landscape, machine, where as through these sort of visual associations, where this is how I'm trying to create narrative, mm -hmm. through visual associations, not through telling a story, not through sort of morally um, obliging somehow the visitor or the expectator to take sort of some um, standpoint on this. I think I'm really working through materiality, visualization, some sort of um, sort of this sort of pulsational force, if you want, of material materiality itself, where you might understand landscape in the first frame 
as such a thing. But if uh, then I put that landscape in connection with the body later on, you understand it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So there's this sort of weird mounting, dismounting, mounting, dismounting, where you're kind of constantly, I hope anyway, on guard in the sense that you I, what I want the spectators to s sort of be held or suspended in the present yeah. and not really know where you're going. You're kind of led on a story, but then you're not. And then you every time you think you've understood the story, it gets whack. There's another, these train tracks or the whack, the train that it sort of leads you in another direction. So there's this constant sort of fragmentation of, of, what the mega narrative, the meta narrative could be, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. so it's not a prescribed critique, an argument around con colonialism. It's an investigation of different consequences and manifestations yeah. that have a, a kind of visual um, dimension within the film. Yeah. So how d how does when you use the moments of archive, how does that sit yeah. in there? Um. Well, I guess it goes back to, you know, I was saying about earlier on, I suppose, this question of history somehow always being the starter point. Um, uh, in this case, the archive, I mean, you can sort of see there was, I, if I think, if I've got it right, there's a sort of great big landscape, the explosion, and then this little photograph. Um, and where it, he's kind of revealed and, and, and covered over and then he's opened up and then he's, and he's got a great big smile on his face. Um, so I don't think I need to say, do I? You know, I think it's sort of explosion, smile, um, you know, white guy with a tie. Um, I think I don't need to spell it out, you know, that, that, that there's, this sort of, there's this sort of referencing to, I suppose... I suppose, yes, that kind of um, violence with a smile on the mm -hmm. landscape. or um, And then in another scene, for example, sorry, I'm jumping around with these for a bit, but uh, uh, there's a scene with the horses. Oh, here they are. Sorry. This scene, for example, which comes about later in the film. Um, the uh, British... And Americans, because first of all, it was started by the Guggenheims, and then the British uh, took over the industry as they took over the train in the north of Chile. Um, and interesting, quite interesting, I think, in a way that the train, like I've said earlier, the train kind of happened as according to how the mine started. So they would build the train and a little sort of kilometer further, as far as they could get in the desert, as far as industry was going. So it was kind of this sort of thing that kind of, you know, panned out together. But anyway, um, curiously, they would play w uh, polo out in the desert. Um, so these were a few shots of, you could just about see there, these guys playing uh, uh, polo in the, in the desert, which is just about as absurd as you can get, uh, you know. Um, yeah. And this appears as a kind of... Um, almost like a sort of uh, uh, surreal, what would you call, I don't know, a sort of visage or something, mm -hmm. a mirage mm -hmm. rather, in the desert. This appears at the end of the film as a kind of reenactment, modern day reenactment of, of these things. So there's all these kind of little winks to how I suppose I'm using archive and then and sort of uh, making archive happen somehow in the present, linking archive with present past. Um, but I, I hope, anyway, at least not in a, a sort of direct, um, almost, I would say, kind of moralistic way. Yeah. And this, what you've touched on there, this somewhat, the, the, the archive is actually one of the sources of this surreal aspect mm. to the film. Because I think that's one of the m most surprising parts of the film is is when it takes these surreal twists. And particularly when we get into the town and into the theater, and you yeah. have certain characters yeah. that you're following there, which are 
Yes, I mean, I suppose these characters, which um, they only just appear. Oh gosh, it's like they there he is. These kind of cloaked uh, phantasmas, um, which they appear in this. The there is a, a theatre. Actually, this was filmed in a, not in Maria Elena, but there's another, a very sort of a ruined site, very near to Maria Elena, where there's this old theatre. It actually en didn't end up. As <laughs> we filmed about half, at least a day there, and very little actually appears <laughs> in the film. But um, I think it relates to this sort of. Yes, yeah, sort of the sense of the absurd and how, again, to sort of interrupt in a way this very almost formal, you know, you could even say, well, abstraction, minimalist mm -hmm. tropes, uh, putting these kind of like sort of almost fancy dress type of figures in there. But again, if you see during the film how I relate that, I relate this, the, the previous shot to this is actually a massive sort of open structured kind of f f shot of the stars, these sparkling stars, and then we go back to the sparkling sort of out kind of thing of this kind of weird characters that just dart about uh, between scenes. Um, so I suppose for me it's another way of, uh, I suppose it was, well, there's one phantasmagoric sort of sensation of it. And then there's this, I suppose, I on the back of there were this project I'd filmed on the back of another um, uh, project, again, to do with sort of painting, which was much more theatrical and much more about dressing up and sort of um, um, tab recreating tableau vivants and things like this. So I think this is where this sort of this element came in. And, and it's always about throwing you off, I mm -hmm. think, yeah. Mm -hmm. so in this sense, do you think of Maria Elena as being this kind of pivotal work between yeah. these kind of essays on colonialism yeah. and then what you've moved on to more recently, which are these performative pieces and yeah. tableau um, that also have filmic elements to them, but yeah. they're much they're much more performed and um, in that sense, yeah. I mean, I think there's always been this kind of, and even in these, like you say, more essay-like films, there is a sort of performative element in all of them. There's always something strange that I bring along. Mm -hmm. um, and, there's, and there's, I suppose, this this way I'm uh, sort of constellating this vision of the stuff that I'm interested, like I was saying, around the film that might not necessarily be historic. They're sort of, sort of tropes that I latch on to. Um, and... and I think again, it, it, it's it's there. <laughs> my work is it is quite different in its forms and, and formats, really. So, I think it all goes back again to to painting because these tableau vivants that I make would be making with sort of multiple screens happening at the same time. Again, go back to how well, it's hard to descri describe them in terms. Of I suppose what we're talking about now, but there, I suppose these sort of maybe nine images that you might get on one um, one screen, that are CCTV images, and I'm capturing these um, images of a, these tableau vivants. But anyway, not what we're going to talk about today. But again, it goes back to this again, how kind of somehow the stasis of painting, because painting for me is about stillness, um, uh, how I could put the stasis of painting and the movement of image in one image. So um, I think it might seem like a jump on, but this, th th these kind of things also do kind of happen um, in these pieces as well, where there's this sort of nothingness or stillness and then interrupted by these sort of performative, farcical mm -hmm. um, moments actions. of comedy and yeah. moments of, but ironic, as well, I guess. 
Yes, I think it's a double double turn, double helix, <laughs> double <laughs> twist, double, double edged, double, edged, double edged, edged kind of comic yeah. moments. Yeah, um. yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I think. Same applies to sound in the films as well, mm -hmm. where sound is used in this push and pull sense where m maybe what you're looking at is not what you're hearing. And I use sound as these kind of, um, kind of a, a sort of a way of pulling you out at the same time pulling you in to an image. So you might get, yes, the same sound that links two very different images, um, or different sounds, different images, um, or something that is not related. Mostly, in, in the terms of this project, I, I recorded on site. Everything mm -hmm. was, but sometimes, n uh, or, or, or about fifty percent of the time, it's not in sync. The sound. It's this, uh, there's this disjuncture between yeah. the visual image and the, and the, yeah. and the soundtrack. Yes, and some t you know, with the working with um, Felix Bloom as the the, the um, sound recorders, he, he he might be an hour away from us, um, and literally, literally an hour and spatially, uh, spatially in terms of like recording sounds, which might then kind of get mixed in into the you know the final mix. But um, I mean, it sounds really crazy. But one thing I found in the desert and in um, in, f in the jungle is it's actually really hard to get pure sound because mm -hmm. nearly everywhere you go now in the world there is radios, there's uh, cars, there's it's quite hard to get these sort of pure sounds. Not that I'm necessarily interested in pure sound, but even in the Atacama, yes, yeah, it's, it's really it's quite strange. There's always some you know mm -hmm. um, something going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a sort of terrorizing <laughs> sort of thought in a way that there's always something, you know, noisy uh, speakers, uh, lorries, um, yeah. In fact, I had a final question which was more of a practical nature, which is in places like the deep Amazon or the Atacama, what are the challenges of making a film in that, those kinds of locations? Mm. They were different in in both. I mean, uh, in 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 the Amazon, of course, you get eaten up. You get eaten alive, literally, with um, these funny little. Um, they're not uh, mosquitoes, but things that just dig into your skin. So that was extremely uncomfortable and extremely hot mm. and sweaty. And uh, and then here in the in the Atacama, the light is, and I think this was something that I tried to show in the film itself, because actually the film is the the color correction on the on um, Maria Elena is kind of slightly pushed to this limit where you're it's almost blinded. It's slightly white. It's mm -hmm. quite white, and mm -hmm. that was you know slightly pushed and forced to the end there, where you're 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 actually sort of on a limit of is this something correct or if it's not, you know, uh, in terms of the colour correction. In fact, it's wildly off the... The, the level the of exposure kind of and yeah. the level of... So um, I wanted that kind of sensation in the film where it's 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 just kind of almost blinding. Mm -hmm. um, or bleached. Uh, bleached out. Yeah. Where everything does seem very bleached out and and actually, well, of course, extremely dry. So your strangeness of shadows, very few shadows in the desert. Um, and then in in the Amazon, I suppose it was just this, um, you know, wanting to do something of high quality, but knowing that all the time, all your equipment is subject to humidity. You have to travel around with your stuff in these special boxes so that the lenses don't get um, humidified, messed mm. up, um, and here actually, on the other, on the converse side, I suppose it was here was this just this brutality of the desert, and and at the same time these huge distances that we were covering because it was a three week shoot, and we were kind of going from all sides of 
all sides of the, sort of the, the compass and, and through the desert. Um, yeah, so they were very, very sort of mm -hmm. different challenges. So three wi weeks of filming, and then how long to edit? And actually, um, because so much of the work is then yeah. done afterwards. Yes, yeah, like hugely away. for me, because I don't, I don't work with scripts. I work with a set of kind of visualizations and things that I really know that I want to achieve um, before. Um, and those things might be subject to some kind of uh, accidental, um, you know, um, things happening along the way. Um, but it's a sort of, we have a, a schedule of like, we're going here, this, that, you know, it's quite tight because obviously, you know, money and time is <laughs> important. You have to fit into that schedule. Um, but, um, uh, at the same time, uh, I don't know when I'm filming if it's this is going to be the first shot, the last shot, the middle shot. Mm -hmm. I have no so idea. When you get into the editing studio, you then compose. I mean, in a way, this is also like being a painter applying mm. brush strokes. You, you're yeah. sort of composing it into a whole kind of collage. Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose editing is collage, isn't it? but yeah. it, it is. It's it's it is quite painterly, quite organic in a way mm -hmm. that where I can be months, definitely months, um, editing. That's the long part and probably, probably for me the most enjoyable part, mm -hmm. um, where it goes backwards and forwards with edits and, you know, I suppose like most people you end up, you know, reducing and reducing. And then my timelines are quite weird, um, whereas there's these sort of maybe, I don't know, eight, ten lines of stuff that I might kind of you know, that from three, maybe a couple of weeks back where I thought that sound doesn't work and then it just suddenly comes, kind of gets sifted up from the bottom of the timeline um, and uh, and somehow there's that kind of moment when it, at least to me, seems to work. I like to generally leave things for s quite some time. I don't like doing things quickly and then having to get them out because I think there's always this sort of process where you know, it's always that kind of feeling like the next day when you wake up, something that was a good idea at three in the morning, eh, the next day is not such a good idea. So there's this sort of feeling in, in, in a sense that luxury where I like to have that month or two before it leaves the studio where, you know, where I feel very sure that this is the final edit. Because I suppose, you know, it's like finishing a painting, it's like finishing, but you can always go on and on and on. But yeah. Knowing when to stop. Knowing when to stop, yeah. But it, there is, um, I suppose, that kind of feeling of um, it really is a it's, a, it's a very long process. And I al also edit simultaneously with sound. I, n I never do a, a l an image edit and then stick the sound on top. Mm -hmm. It's always uh, image sound, image sound at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's quite... Um, it seems yeah. quite intuitive then. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know what I've filmed, mm -hmm. um, and I know, I suppose, why I filmed or recorded those sounds. So there is an intuitive sense of what you kind of want at that moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially in this film, whereas it, I think at Fordlandia, which was very much about horizontality, about animal body machine, you know, this this film is about vertical relationships it's about mineralization it's about geology it's about the sky the massive open sky of the atacama and this sort of macro ness of geology and, and and mineralization so it's a sort of how those two things all connect mm. through this praxis of body i think body is really really important in my this fragmented body where you know we all these days we're all we're all part and parcel of this consumption of, you know, this lithium that goes into our iPhones or through our bodies and this this way in which this stuff is kind of moving itself around the world, you know. Mm -hmm. So that connection between, I suppose, sort of local and macro and body and consumption and, and at the same time, um, you know, that, that yeah, the, the sort of... Um, I suppose scale yeah. of, of how these of consumption really. 
I think what you just said was a really brilliant summary of some of the things that I, I if we had more time, I would have asked mm -hmm. about scale, body, these, these themes mm -hmm. which run through the film. But I want there to be time yeah. for other people to ask questions. So I thought maybe we should open to the floor and if anyone has a question for Melanie, um, this is your moment. No questions? Um, in this one, not so many, I think. We, we, we were like 10 or 11. Um, oh, in all the whole process, you mean? From beginning to end. Well, I edit with um, an operator, so it's just two of us. <laughs> and I can never imagine anybody else, like I was saying, you know, being um, editing these things because they seem so personal. Um, and yeah, I mean, probably t sort of 10 to 15 people involved in other stuff that I've done has been much bigger and there's many more people involved. Um, Fort Lundy was about the same. Um, cause it's just shifting a lot of people around through the desert is, you know, there's a complicated logistics to it, so to it all. Um, and yeah, Th but there was a, um, Julian Devoe, this is the cameraman, and then a drone operator from Chile, production assistant, so you know, kind of normal stuff, but um, quite small, and yet not small, I suppose. You know, it's a sort of, I, I think it, we, there's a sort of filmic um, sense of production, but I think I was, there's, there's a definitely, again, um, shifting all those hierarchies of sort of pro proper film, or whatever proper film is. Okay. Um, I wanted to pick up on the last comment about toxicity and the body, yeah. um, because obviously that is, in a way, what is also at stake right? yeah. in the way which our, which actually matter penetrates yeah. our bodies, and we no longer can distinguish between what's inside and outside. Yeah. And and as Tim Morton says, there is in the Anthropocene there is no yeah. outside. No, there is no place yeah. where to dump things anymore. Everything is in us, in yeah. us, and in our sort of immediate environments. And and I wonder how, in a way, in a way, that being affected and bodily or carrying the bodily information of toxicity also sort of informs the work. Or if you could speak a bit more about that, you know how the granularity of that toxicity, that which is in the air and in the body and the fluids and the waters. Uh, that is something that... Yeah, uh, it's, I think it's, it's something that I wrestle with and I, I think I don't, you know, I don't know always how successful, I mean, it's hard for me to say because I make these things, how successful that is, but it's something I'm always... Um, conscious of trying to do when I'm making um, um, a film. It's like how all these things add up and are disjunctured at the same time. So how to describe that kind of, I think it's, because when we think about landscape, it's so immobile landscape. So one of the things that I was really trying to think about in, the, in both projects is how do you kind of animate landscape how do you talk through the body and landscape in these in these things and it's quite it's actually really hard it's actually a really hard thing to do and um um and i suppose the way that i've um found to to do it is is through this sort of fracturing of the body, where the body is there's just an ear, or there's just a finger, or there's just, <laughs> and it, and or there's just a bit of leg or toe or, or whatever. There's, there's they quite appear a lot in work that I'm doing. So it's kind of I suppose this sort of disconnection and joining of body somehow with the landscape, and at the same time, 
um, understanding or, or trying to understand some uh, some kind of praxis of the of body. Um, and um, like I say, I'm not, I'm not I don't know how always how successful that is because th this you know the, and there's something that I'm really interested in and I guess th through scale which I'm interested in going further and further into this is that how through film without going into animation you know, or computer generated image how can you describe this kind of um, uh, way in which you know, or, or depiction of landscape through bodies somehow. And I think it, for me it's through these sort of pulsational forces of materiality that I'm really trying to um, think about these questions. And, um, um, and uh, I think it's, yeah, I suppose it's this, this disconnection and connection of body all the time, I suppose. That that's how I'm trying to... I don't know if it's necessarily always toxicity, but in this project maybe, but in other projects it's about, you know, connection, disconnection. Hmm. Um, kind of continuing on that, because I think it's so interesting about in this disjunction trying to create, capture the present moment, so actually bringing people to be quite present through this kind of elliptical ways of moving and then there's also that sense of paradox and maybe talking a bit more about that because I think in maybe also with the toxicity that there is no maybe escaping mm -hmm. where we are, but there's always, um, as uh, Romain was saying this morning, there's this desire to escape, you know, somehow the present moment, like we're either in the past or in the yeah. future. Yeah. And yeah. kind of how that paradox, maybe how yes. you utilize that because I think, yeah, um, I think it comes it's across. I think so. um, that's actually, yeah, that's a good point, which I probably didn't mention is this collapse of time in the films, I think. There's because there's historic time, there's sort of landscape glacial time <laughs> in a way, or but not in this clip, but you know, the geological time somehow. And then there's the present, which I'm, so yes, I'm definitely working and, and collapsing all these times into, well, filmic time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But which is, you have also, the images of the universe, the night sky that you mentioned, and this is this other level of, you know, the particular from the universe to down to the grain of sand. Yes. As well. yeah. I mean, I d I'm definitely aware of trying to do that, that sort of weird, you and, and I think these are the spaces which we all live in these days, these collapsed times and visualizations where, and, and, and you know, another thing I didn't really talk about today was this sense of the weird. I mean, uh, kind of into the weird, or you know, that I don't. What is this? Is this? You know, I'm in one space, but I'm not in this space. But I'm suspended here, but I'm not. And and I think that that's something. I'm this, and I think these these are the sort of spaces that we live in. We live in our own bodily space, but we also live in these far off spaces. So is it how these things kind of connect you know, from the far off, the far, 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 far off to the nearest, 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 kind of. Um, and this, this is how I think it causes the weird that, that we all live in, you know. Hi, um, why do you think it's important for you to travel to these locations to kind of document these things happening here rather than, I guess, focusing on the consequence of the uh, industry in how we interact with it in our everyday life? That's also a really good question because like, the subsequent pro projects that I've done, I've been filming them from, from home. <laughs> Uh, and that's something that I'm now in, sort of in thinking of the ecology of image somehow. <laughs> Is such a thing of kind of I've been film I've done um, uh, my latest two, two projects have been filmed on FaceTime Skype, where you so you never leave home, and so that I think bring is bringing in another uh, sort of element of distance and 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 and, and time on these projects where 
and also added challenges because you know when you're directing if, if someone else is on the camera left and right become quite challenging and this these kind of things so um, I think this is yeah something else that I'm uh, I really questioned uh, because uh, you know thinking about Fordlandia if I was retracing Henry Ford's sort of 19th century journey of the you know the traveler 19th 20 early 20th century traveler you know to the exotic um, I suppose what I was trying to do in Fordlandia was like I said earlier take out the notion of space or sorry place you know by focusing on these very different sort of uh, this the very different way of framing and not really letting anybody exactly or tell the story of where I was going I suppose then these sub sub subsequent projects have been about totally, you know, blasting that idea of the need to travel um, anyway, you know. Um, and, um, yeah, they have their own challenges, definitely, but um, it's definitely sort of kind of where I'm at now, of, yeah, in terms of filming. Uh. So um, I think we can wrap it up here, especially because the fair is now opening. So with all these uh, thoughts in mind, I think it's good to go upstairs and also see the, the film in its integrity. Thank you so much to the both of you, Melanie and Tanya. And I'll see you all tomorrow for the last two talks of the program. <laughs>